Good Tuesday, and thanks for being here on this 19th day of April, where our luck is about to run out of sorts. High pressure is not going to be sticking around and being in charge for much, much longer. We've still got some nice weather in store, but as far as the picture-perfect, crystal clear and calm days, well, those are coming to an end. We've got a chance of some showers throughout your forecast. Temperatures are going to fluctuate as well. We'll tell you more about that, which all begins relatively soon, weather-wise, in just a few moments. Highlights tonight and headlines will include coverage of last night's regular session of the Sayersville City Council, discussions centered around a generator for the waterworks, unsightly and uninspected mobile homes and other structures, water rates on the increase on the city and county level, and some other information uh, pertaining to that subject as well. As well as a recall, I wanted to pass along to you a whole lot of news out there tonight, but uh, I can think of several members of my family and a lot of friends that are going to be affected by this recall. And by and large, uh, we as human beings tend to ignore recalls and not see that uh, whatever product we have gets the appropriate repair or fix. And this could prove to be deadly for a very popular ATV, a line of ATVs nonetheless. All of that in more detail in just a few moments. Only a few reports from around the region. A few updates from a few reports from yesterday. And turning to elsewhere, we now know the identity of a couple of individuals which have died across the state of Kentucky closest to home. We now know that a Perry County man identified as 23-year-old Justin Miller was the man who lost his life yesterday morning while cutting tree limbs in the Wick community of Breathitt County. He reportedly came into contact with some utility lines while working for the uh, Aspen Tree Expert Company. He was still in the tree upon arrival of rescue and emergency personnel and was pronounced dead at the scene by Breathitt County Coroner George Griffith. His body was sent to the state medical examiner's office in Frankfurt for an autopsy, and the death is under investigation. But once again, his identity released as and confirmed as 23-year-old Justin Miller of Perry County. And it's not local or even regional news but something we want to make note of, a two-year-old found dead in a vehicle outside of an elementary school in Jefferson County yesterday. Uh, Guttermuth Elementary School was the scene where around 4 o'clock we know that carpool attendants noticed an unresponsive child in the back seat of a vehicle in the carpool lane. School staff and emergency personnel immediately began CPR and other life-saving techniques. However, the child was pronounced dead soon thereafter. Today, that child identified as two-year-old Levante Swain. The child's cause of death, says the coroner reports, is consistent with hyperthermia. We all understand as well that he was in a vehicle, the child was in a vehicle that was being driven by a daycare employee when found. They also estimate that the child had been in that car for sometime around four hours. That investigation too ongoing. In a case ongoing, former administrative law judge David B. Doherty pled not guilty today in federal court in Lexington. He has a pretrial conference set for May the 18th and a trial date set for June the 7th. He was uh, allowed to remain in the custody of his wife pending the upcoming court proceedings and trial. And of course, he is a judge involved in the Social Security fraud case against Eric Kahn as well as others. A man from Johnson County, or at least I can say at this hour, a man in Johnson County was airlifted to the Cabell Huntington Hospital earlier this morning after a tree fell on him and happened in the Oil Springs area near the Oil Springs Elementary, which is where a landing zone was established. He was life flighted from that location, from that landing zone to Cabell Huntington. And no identity, no update on his condition at this hour, but he was said to be cutting trees on a hillside where he was discovered. He did suffer some serious, possible life-threatening injuries as well. Our top headlines in just a few moments. Right now, we're going to do things just a bit out of sorts, and here's a few brief announcements on tonight's McGoffin Farm Bureau community calendar. For the past few days, I've been telling you about the garden workshops at the McGoffin County Extension Office. This is on Thursday and Friday at noon both days. They're going to talk about and show you hands-on how to build a raised bed garden on Thursday, and then tell you how to get the most out of your small garden on Friday. Now they've added a, another event to this week's list. And this one sounds just as cool and interesting. The McGoffin County Extension Service presents the World of Hummingbirds with special guest Bill Gordon. He is with the High Adventure Wilderness School, where you can come and go to the Extension Office here in McGoffin County this Thursday at 6 and explore the world of the amazing hummingbird with fascinating looks into new research about its life and habits. So... Be sure, if you have any time you want to take in this event, it sounds to be entertaining, 
informative and fun. And as well, for door prizes, they're giving away hummingbird feeders. And it's like most everything, if not everything else at the Extension office, it's all free. Thursday at 6. And I told you, a relatively brief community calendar for this Tuesday it gives me just a second to remind you if you've got birthdays, anniversaries, or calendar announcements, mail, email, Facebook, phone, fax, or drop them off here at the studio. If you'll tell me, I'll tell everyone about them. And remember, our program is always available the following day in case you missed it or need to catch it again on our website at yournewstoday.com. For high-speed internet starting at 15 meg for all of your gaming, movie, home, and business solutions, or to watch TV, including your favorite local channels, without a contract, with hundreds of channels, and digital and HD quality, and to stay connected 24-7 with friends and family, a direct line to 911, or to give your business the link it needs, choose telephone service you know is always there. Just click on their link on this site to find out how affordable the latest technology and communications can be. Foothills Communications. A regular session of the Sagersville City Council last night saw discussions centering around several topics, several on the agenda and some not. Those not on the agenda but discussed at length were water rates for the city and for the county and other topics uh, related to that subject as well as unsightly and what is said to maybe be the fear of uninspected mobile homes and other structures in the city limits. The council voted to split costs of a $1,200 GPS system with the Sagersville Waterworks. The Waterworks will use the device to map water lines throughout the city with the city government using the same device for mapping of streets and boundaries within the city limits. And there was discussion about water rates, a recent increase to the Sagersville Waterworks customers, which will be seen in the next billing cycle. Water rates were increased at the Sagersville Waterworks, while it was also noted that they are still losing money with the sale of water from the city utility to the county utility, and that the county has also raised their rates an estimated 15%, I believe, already in effect. The problem is with, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll say a little something about the water right now, they done a study, they finally got the study in, and what we do is we, it costs us $2.65 per thousand to purify the water, to drink. We sell it to the, you know, it costs us three dollars and four cents. Mm -hmm. We sell it to the county for two dollars and sixty-five cents through a contract that they signed fifteen years ago. So there you go. We lose money on the water, but you know, but but even with that said, with the rates the way they are in the city, we make money on the water, but we still lose on the sewer. That's Has the city ever paid the county off on that debt they owe? No, we haven't. What's holding that up here? Until the waterworks pays us, and then we pay them. Oh. <laughs> That's uh, what? 50000 50000 No interest. Just a trade out loan from the McGough County nothing, Water District. As far as I've heard, nothing's been paid. It hasn't been paid. It's hard to come up with $50,000 when you're just struggling to well, keep some water. Well, it's not water rate's been going up every year for the last three years. If you go back three years and see how much the water company was losing, and now you're saying it's breaking even, then you'd see where all that money's going. That what, what they've done to try to do it. And it's getting ready to blow up again, you said. So another increase. No, 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 no. What we agreed to do when I took over, and we did, we said we was going to pass the water rates onto the city at 10% a year for three years. Right. They only raised it two years in a row. They didn't raise it last year, so we've got one year, and now they're just going to raise it 5% instead of 10%. So they're trying to keep it down and doing the best they can, but that's uh, and then after this year they're going to start doing cost to live like a one and a half or two percent is what they're talking about. So keep up with the cost of living. So I mean, keep, it, you raise it constantly. Just <laughs> raise it every year a little bit, yeah, and, and not raise it. But if you've seen where they was at before, when I took over, when I, AEP comes in here and says, well, they uh, was an eighty thousand dollar electric bill, and on Friday we're going to turn the electric off. Oh, well, this would be good everybody. ideas if everybody if it's making if it had been making money all these years and they had the surplus they had twenty years ago and they hadn't squandered all the money up our hell it'd been great. But they did. And now we are feeling the effect of it and we gotta do do the best we can, you know. Anywhere else somebody probably went to jail with that stuff. But not here. Now you got away with it. You know, and that's fine. I ain't got no problem with that and you'll get away with it. But we gotta move forward and we can't dwell in the past and we gotta make it the best we can. And as long as I'm there, I'm gonna make it the best we can because we, we got the best water in eastern Kentucky, You're probably the state, according to the state, that comes in and monitors our water now. In a recent meeting, the Sagersville Water Works raised rates on the water and sewage bill for their customers 5%. That will take effect the next billing cycle, I am told. The original plan, says Mayor Shepard when he took office several years ago, was that there would be three consecutive rates of 10% a year 
for three years in a row, ultimately adding 30% to the water and sewer bills. He says the first year there was a 10%. The second year there was also a 10% increase. He said there was no increase the third year, and now with this they will add a 5% increase for the fourth year. And he says he is still working to try to address the situation with the city selling water to the county cheaper than it costs the city to produce and treat that water. The mayor also brought up for discussion purchasing a large generator to run the pumps that take the water from the river to the treatment plant. Currently there is a large generator at the Sagersville Waterworks which will operate it in event of a power outage or disaster such as the tornado of 2012. But to keep processing water, they have to be able to pull the water from the intake and the river. The mayor proposed purchasing a mobile unit on a trailer that could be used in that manner as well as utilized by the city in other locations or in other cases of emergency. It was an estimated cost of $24,000. They could make payments on that total, and it was something that they would look at during the next budget cycle. And he also outlined in the mayor's report a $10,000 grant acquired by David May, who wrote the grant that will go towards purchasing flower pots and street signs in portions of the city, as well as an update on the restaurant road project and storm shelters that the city has purchased. Uh, David May worked on it and got it for $10,000, and it's going to pay for uh, 25 hanging pots that we put around the city for fire to go in. It's going to pay for some signage to go up at historical areas in the city, like uh, over here where the old courthouse used to be. It'll have a, a thing there and have a picture of the, old court, the first courthouse and have information on it. People can come up and it's got some kind of thing on it. You can use your phone on it with an app and, and read about all the, that. So we got that, and uh, we're going to start working on that just in the next little bit, getting all that stuff started. Hopefully have it before spring gets them too far along. Uh, they're going to let out bids on the contract on Restaurant Row uh, June 29th, but they're already started turning down some of the buildings. Most of the tenants have already been told to be out by a certain date. I think the dollar store will be closed on the 15th of May. Uh, they give Mi Hacienda a little extension because their building's not ready here. They're moving back down to where the strip mall is, where that uh, cafe was beside the Appalachia Wireless. And, but they're getting ready to tear all that stuff down and hopefully by August uh, they'll be, uh, be working on the road up there. Uh, the storm shelters, I've talked with the state, up there where the Mighty Mart got blown down, they're not going to, they bought that, the state did, and they're, they're moving our sewer uh, pump station into that area, but it's plenty big enough for us to sit one of the shelters there if the state will let us. Uh, the guy, I talked to John Samuels up here at the transportation department and he's put in a couple of phone calls and uh, that would have it about direct, one directly on the parkway and then the other would put down in town here somewhere, if that would agree with you all. In addition to other discussions which centered around a comment by Councilman Jeff Bailey fielding complaints about kids boxing, barefisted boxing in the Ramey Park, which the mayor was aware of as well as the city police, as well as potholes in several areas of the city limits where the mayor said that as soon as the coal patch continues to heat up, they'll be targeting those areas. There was discussion about mobile homes and their surroundings. Councilman Tom Frazier referred to continual complaints on the subject. Some people are moving trailers in the city and close to the county here, or close to the city. And I don't think they're being inspected. You know, if you get a mover, a uh, licensed mover, he's going to... Tie, tie those trailers down. That's right, they put ties on. Tie them. Oh, they put tie on them and they tie them down, but now I don't think this, this other bunch is doing them. I think they're just bringing them in overnight. Well, I ain't seen nothing uh -huh. that's been brought well, in. Well, now, whoever that loses that trailer has to give you a certification that it's legal. Yeah, unless the truck moves it. But there ain't no other somebody can move it. You can't get electric if somebody else does it with no license. Well, how can you, you get You do have to have a permit. How do you get electricity without a door? Really? That's what I'm saying. You yeah. have to have that sticker. It's I, ID stickers and name of it. I've got them all over my trailers, two of them on each trailer. So you think all the trailers in that city is all right then? Well, I don't know about that, yeah. but I don't See, mind. The problem is we grandfathered that in, so anything that's already in the city, we don't have no retainers, but we don't inspect. We only inspect the ones they move. In. Now the state, and I've got a copy of there, I got it last two weeks ago because everybody's been complaining. I got the state, as a health department, we inspect trailers, but we inspect for garbage, uh, different things, but we can't 
it's not uh, like doors off or something like that. It's just certain things that the state inspects for, and we charge the trailer guys a fee on it. You have to have a sticker from the uh, from health from uh, fire department, not a fire department, uh, she's an inspector, Gail Ward down there, mm -hmm. she comes and inspects them, gives you a sticker, mm -hmm. and you have to give that to the electrical inspector, uh, inspector. And then there another one too, you have to get it for the, the no, from uh, the trailer mover. Whoever moves your trailer has to give you a sticker too. It's just a rip off, $125 a piece, just take the truck. Most of the problems I get is the trash around them or, yeah, or something like that. that or, you know, you know, what for. But, like I say, our health inspector, uh, Patrick Boyd up there, he goes around and inspects right. the lots. But the problem is we only inspect them every three months or so. We go inspect them one month, we tell them to clean everything up, they clean it up, we go back out and look, it's clean, and in two more months, hell, they've got garbage piled out again. You know, it's, and, it, and what we've decided, or what I've decided, and I've talked, is the last time we had a complaint, we wrote the property owner because it's really the property owner, not the trailer renter. That's right. Not, is, is responsible for that. That's right. So we can find, our word says if they, if it's not just for trailers, but anybody that lets the garbage or something we bail up, we can we can find them $100 a day. That's that's the ordinance. Not going to have to be a trailer, you know. As far as the doors on them and the windows on them, that's a state inspector. We, I have no, the state don't have no control, and we don't have an ordinance that says anything about that. So, you know, that's the thing. My biggest problem is the nastiness and the bad looks of them, you know. And I'm not talking about some of them. You know, I'm, people know the ones I'm talking about, the ones I have problems with. Our last headlines in just a moment. I received word of the following recall earlier today and immediately started adding up friends and or family that this does affect as they have machines involved in these particular model years. As the Consumer Product Safety Commission today announced the recall of more than 100,000 very popular Razor models of Polaris side-by-sides in several different configurations and model years. Reports are that these ROVs, as they are referring to them, recreational off-road vehicles, have caught fire while consumers have been driving them, and that does pose serious fire and burn hazards to drivers as well as passengers. As a result, the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission, in cooperation with Polaris, is announcing a recall of about 133,000 Polaris model year 2013, 14, 15, and 16 Razor 900 and Razor 1000 ROVs. The CPSC and Polaris are both warning customers and consumers to stop using these recreational vehicles immediately and contact their Polaris dealer for a free repair. And Polaris has also agreed to voluntarily suspend the sale of all these same recalled vehicles until they are repaired. Polaris says they've received more than 160 reports of fires with the recalled Razor ROVs, one resulting in the death of a 15-year-old passenger we understand it happened after a rollover accident that resulted in a fire. Also, they said they've received 19 reports of injuries, including first, second, and third degree burns. You can go to Polaris.com to determine if your Razor's VIN number is included in the recall. You can also find the complete list at the Consumer Product Safety Commission's website at cpsc.gov. Recalled are 2013 and 14 Razor XP900s. 14, 15, and 16 Razor XP1000s, 15 and 16 model year Razor 900s, 15 and 16 Razor S900s, and 2016 Razor S1000 models. You can find the VIN most often located on the driver's side frame rail above the PVT cover. Now here we are with your Licking Valley RECC forecast, and here we are bearing down on 630, and I'm at 85 degrees and holding will fall to 50 tonight, about 8 degrees milder than last evening, but still light jacket if you're catching some late night softball, baseball possibly uh, at the athletic complex. We'll see clouds on the increase tonight, mostly cloudy skies and a low of 50 and a light wind tomorrow. We'll see some isolated showers and thunderstorms after 5 tomorrow evening and afternoon. Otherwise, partly sunny and close to 80 again. That's a 10% chance of showers early. By tomorrow night, we'll bump it up to a 20% chance, I think, at most for some isolated showers, maybe a thunderstorm or two. Thursday looks to be the wet one. We should see a front bring us scattered showers and thunderstorms uh, on and off throughout the day with a daytime high of 75. Winds gusting upwards of 16 miles per hour, possibly at times becoming uh, south, southwest. Thursday night, still a 50% chance of some showers, maybe a few thunderstorms, still cloudy skies.
and we'll wrap up the work week a bit cooler for a few days on end. We have mostly cloudy and 73 on your Friday. Still can't shake a chance of showers and thunderstorms from that front. We'll have a 50% chance it will diminish as Friday goes on. Clear weather for certainty returns for the weekend. Saturday, 72 and partly sunny. Sunny and 77 on your Sunday. And I think I've got near 80 and sunny again on your Monday as well. It's going to wrap it up for this Tuesday. We're already working on news for tomorrow, as is quite and most often the case. One way or the other, it's going to have news that you'll only see with me. So we hope you'll join us then for now. Enjoy the rest of your beautiful Tuesday evening.